Welcome to the Economic and Political History Podcast, where we discuss the latest ideas on the intersection of economics, political science, and history. Hi, everyone. Welcome to a new episode of the Economic and Political History Podcast. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. And today I have the great pleasure of being with Guido Alfani, his professor of economic history at Bacani University. And he's the author of As Gods Among Men, A History of the Rich in the West. I hope you are being able to see the cover because it's actually one of the nicest covers and the title, <laughs> I, I really love the title, one of the uh, probably most beautiful titles of economic history books that I've covered so far. And Guido is here with us. I'm I'm very happy of of having him here. Uh, Guido, how are you? Very fine, thank you, and well met. Uh, thanks for being here. And I would like to start by asking you about your your life and your career. Um, you work in uh, at Bocconi. I know you're you're Italian, but tell us a bit more about how you ended up being the type of scholar that you are, someone that is particularly interested in inequality and in very long-term processes, someone that goes deep into archival work. How did you build this type of, of career? Right. Well, I, I started uh, as a student uh, of economics and social sciences. I was a, a student in a, in a program uh, which uh, was uh, very much focused on economics, but also open to other social sciences from economic history to sociology to political science and others. And I think it was very good having this kind of broad exposure to the social sciences because it kind of, you know, makes you uh, a little bit out of the box, maybe. Uh, now, um, why uh, am I interested in inequality? Well, it's a very interesting question. I would say I've always been interested in that. And maybe one of the reasons why I, I decided that I had to work on this is that when in class I, I asked about you know, inequality in, in courses of economics, I, I tended to get uh, answers back then, and I, you know, that was like the, the late 1990s, answers which I didn't find very satisfying. You know, classical answer was like, um, in the end, it doesn't matter much because the important thing is that everybody is going richer, which I, I always thought uh, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, at the very least an incomplete answer to the, to the question. First of all, because inequality is a relative concept, okay? And being a relative concept, the, the way in which we perceive it is actually not entirely dependent on our own uh, level of uh, material well-being. And then... Uh, um, Interestingly, this is a, a topic which I could push you um, very easily uh, as part of my uh, subsequent specialization in, um, in economic history. Economic historians were very welcoming uh, at the time. Uh, I mean, at, at least those uh, uh, with whom I, I, I studied, they were very welcoming of the idea that I wanted to explore also this topic as part of my, of my research. And uh, this was not the main topic of my uh, PhD, um, and this was partly due to um, you know chance because uh, I, I had discovered uh, some uh, records from the 15th and early 16th century, uh, which uh, um, were very interesting. So I started working on uh, uh, historical demography and the history of. Uh, plagues and other epidemics in the late medieval and early modern period. But this always was like uh, uh, my uh, side project. And then after finishing the PhD, I, I, I proposed the topic of, you know, long run inequality trends uh, for small, you know, funding. First, some small internal funding at my university. And the kind of... Um, the kind of results I got from this, which was really like a pet project, made me uh, even more interested in equality because uh, I was working on a few case studies and I realized one important thing, which is that in the 
in the long run, in the pre-industrial times, um, the, the distribution dynamics seems to be pretty independent from the general presumed pattern of economic growth. Okay, so I was finding inequality growth even in areas which were clearly stagnating in the period I was studying, and and this made me ask, uh, you know, what happened more generally, and and this is why. I um, proposed a project for funding to the European Union, to the European Research Council, uh, and I was lucky enough to get funded. And, uh, and this was very important because uh, from the very beginning, this has been also a collective effort. The data collection in the uh, European archives was uh, huge, and this required being able to uh, set up a team. Okay. I, may, I was mentioning my pet project. Uh, it took me like 10 years to develop on my, on my own from archival sources, one single case study. Admittedly, it was a very interesting and very you know, in-depth case study, but it was like one year for one case study, meaning one single city. And, um, and when I had the possibility of uh, you know, putting together a team, uh, you know, the opportunities changed entirely and that's where we started. And uh, that's been like the last uh, 10 to 15 years of my, of my career. Let me ask you more about this collective um, nature of uh, of the research endeavor, right? And I'm I'm curious about how you feel and how you experience the expansion of the interest in inequality, right? In particular, among economic historians. Now, now I'm thinking that well, Thomas Piketty is probably this super visible figure that help to popularize to other audiences uh, the, the 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 topic of inequality. But in a certain way, he's an economic historian. His interests started maybe there. Um, and well, we can also think about Branco's work recently and so on. Was there at some point, well, if you shared the European origin, was there at some point this sense when you were getting involved in inequality that other people that this was a wave that was uh growing the i don't know there was uh, a sense of community how did you experience that that's an excellent question so i will tell the truth <laughs> and the truth unfortunately is that i'm old enough to have um started working on this topic when it wasn't fashionable at all and I can tell you this, I, I, I mean, the, my very first article on, uh, on inequality, and it was my, again, pet project, the, the case study which I mentioned, was turned down by a, by a journal in 2007, uh, because one referee said, you know, yeah. the article is very nice, there is a lot of work there, but unfortunately, we aren't interested in wealth inequality, only maybe in income inequality. And I thought, okay, so... It's we who, <laughs> first of all, I am interested in that. And then you know, which kind of statement is that? I, I, I found that like incredible. And then, uh, uh, of course, uh, 2008 and the beginning of the, of the Great Recession started to change uh, quite radically the picture. Um, I uh, submitted my project to DRC right after the, the beginning of the, of the recession, actually right before it. And then I was funded, and uh, uh, and that was you know I was I was lucky with that. And then of course Thomas Piketty published his book, and the topic became suddenly very fashionable. And uh, I, I, I I I am very happy about that, of course. Uh, but not not only because this makes my own research maybe more relevant to certain debates, but also because I think it's important, right? But I I began working on this when the topic was really not fashionable at all. Um, and uh, I, 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 I could see the change, uh, so to say, on my, on my skin. Um, now we are like 15 years after the beginning of the, of the Great Recession. And um, I remember when I started working on the book, which you mentioned, uh, as God's Among Men, and this is like, um, this was in, uh, in early 2018, actually it was late 2017, I thought, okay, but will this topic be relevant by when I'll be finished? And I thought, yes, because I don't see how this problem is going to go away. And um, so what I, what I mean is from 
2008 on, this has only become more, uh, more and more an important problem, and I think it will be it will continue to be on the uh, research agenda of economic historians and social scientists for for quite a few years more. And there is a lot of work to be done, so it's also a topic which is good for young scholars because you know there is really the opportunity of doing something uh, new. There are many parts uh, of the world for which we know that there are usable sources which haven't been explored yet. And this is because we started relatively late. There was very little effort in trying to measure historical inequality until, again, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. So now that the situation is particularly favorable, I would say. I'm curious about that. I'm going to ask you more about how you see the field in the future. But before that, I, I would like to start to get into the, the, the argument of the book and what you do there. And and the first the first question that I have is, uh, and it's, it's fairly broad, but I'm, I'm pretty interested about how you understand your area of analysis, right? And you, you frame the book as a story of the West, right? And so I want to ask you about that. How do you think about the West, not only as presented in the book, but in your own research, in particular, considering that uh, you do this fairly sort of long durée type of studies, right? What does it mean the West when you're going back to the Middle Ages, right? And how does that change? Uh, how does that change when you when you get closer to to present time? Because also I know that you've been working on societies that most people would argue that are not, are not part of the West, right? So how do you think about that? How do you deal with that in the book and in general in, in your own research? Right. So my, my research, uh, at least the part of my research, which is the based on collection of new information from the archives, which is clearly the part of my research connected to the European project is also constrained by the fact that uh, uh, historical sources must be available because the idea has always been to go back uh, at least to the late Middle Ages, <laughs> sorry, so to the 14th century or when possible to the, um, yes, I mean, to the 15th or when possible to the 14th century because ideally one would also want to study, for example, how the Black Death in the 14th century uh, affects the general distribution of wealth and maybe also income. So this means that there are some parts in particular of Europe which are much uh, better than others because we have more information, especially for the earlier periods. And uh, many European regions are very good for this. And this is, of course, an advantage which I have as an Italian, maybe one of the few advantages that we Italians have right now. But <laughs> you know, in terms of historical sources, being able to work on Tuscany or on Piedmont, surely gives you a, a plus. Uh, and, uh, and this is it, basically. Um, the idea was to try and to compare different parts of Europe for which we had information. So in the projects, we worked on different parts of Italy, then we worked on the low countries in North, uh, in North Europe. We also worked on Germany, we worked on South France, we worked on Spain, we worked on England but not, be, not beyond uh, uh, Europe. And so, I mean, usually in my research, I don't refer to the West as a unit of analysis. I refer to a smaller region, right? Like, you know, a specific part of Italy or the Southern Low Countries or, what, or England. Uh, but in this book, I thought, I and mean, the book is about the rich. So I thought that it was very important to at the very least include North America, the United States in particular. Um, and uh, why the West then? Because I think there is something important in, um, in Western culture shaping how certain societies today look at wealth and inequality, in particular look at wealth and the position of the rich in society. And uh, an important role was played by the Christian religion, right? So that's also another reason why I am like looking at a specific part of the world. The other reason for me to limit myself to the West is that I'm not aware of any other work of this kind for 
other work areas. So the point is, it would be fantastic to be able to compare the social position of the rich in, say, Western Europe compared to East Asia. But, uh, I mean, I think that we can't right now. And uh, I never worked directly on East Asia. So this is beyond my area of expertise and I wouldn't have access to the historical sources also. So this is not something I could do on my own. And I see this book as a, as a starting point. So maybe one day it would be possible to write a global history of the rich and I would love to see that or even to be you know, part of the team uh, piecing that together. But uh, I think that we first need to do more research on other world areas. Uh, right now, there are uh, some important efforts made in uh, trying to reconstruct uh, long-run inequality dynamics in, for example, China or, or Japan, but this is you know, something different. So it's possible now to try and compare what we observe in certain parts of the West with some other world areas. But in terms of, again, looking at the kind of things I want to look at in the book, if I have to rely only on the literature for the areas which I have not researched directly, then I don't think it, then I, I think I couldn't have, I couldn't have done it based on what is available right now. Let me ask you now then about these rich people, right? Uh, how do you how do you define them? What makes someone rich in the sense of uh, what distinguish that person from the rest? And and tell me a bit about the patterns across history that you see in the West, right? We're gonna talk maybe about regional variation later, but there seems to be some big themes across. Right. This um uh, the this entire area that you study, and and I want to hear about that, right? So who are these people, and how have they changed over time? Do we have more of them, less of them? What periods are structural breaks in in, in that uh that story? Right. So I use different definitions of rich in the book, definitions which integrate each other. First, I look at the top percentiles of distribution, the top five percent. I don't go below that because it could be like too many. The top 1% and also the smaller percentiles, the very uh, the very top positions, which you might qualify in certain instances as the super rich, okay? But the problem of looking historically at say the one percenters is that uh, they are always going to be the same percentage of society, like right? 1%. And that's a problem because what we also would know, would want to know is whether across history the rich become more or less abundant. So I use another definition, which is a relative definition, and this is like uncommon. Uh, it's not something that has uh, usually been done, uh, but the idea mirrors um, the concept of relative poverty, right? For measuring relative poverty, you take the distribution and you define as poor those who are below a certain fraction of the median value. I do the same by looking at the top and I define the rich, those who are at least 10 times above the median value of wealth, right? So I look at wealth for defining who is rich. Um, and uh, this means that the prevalence of those who are above, we are 10 times above the median can change across time. And so we can see whether the rich become also more abundant, not only richer, but also more abundant. And what we find in the long run is exactly that. After a phase of uh, decline in wealth inequality, so in the wealth share of the top one or top 5%, and uh, a decline in also in the prevalence of those who are very far from the median towards the top, after the Black Death in the 14th century, and this lasts for one century, one century and a half, depending on the area, then we observe a tendency for the rich becoming to become richer. So the wealth shares of the 1% or top of 5% increase continuously. And also the rich become more abundant, right? There are more people who are at least 10 times above the median. And interestingly, when you calculate, which is the which is 
the percentage of those who are at least 10 times above the median, it tends to fall, at least in pre indarsial times, it tends to fall in between one and 5%. So, you know, this is also something which integrates, as I said, the other definition. So this means that there is, of course, a, a growing number of people and also their descendants who are able to rise to substantial affluence. The rich, at least those at the top, are becoming richer and richer. But this also means that there are people who are left behind. Because then you can do the same thing for the poor, looking at relative poverty, which I did. And uh, what you find is that exactly when the prevalence of the rich increases, you also find in the early modern period that the prevalence of the poor increases. So you have a growing polarization of society, which goes hand in hand with growing inequalities, with a growing wealth share of the top. Uh, and you can work systematically with this kind of approach until, say, the beginning of the 19th century, uh, which is the period that was covered also my my project. That's, you know, mostly this is my, my own uh, data, data quantified by my project for the period 1300, 1300. But then when you move in the 19th and 20th century, it becomes more difficult to work on uh, the prevalence of the rich by looking at, again, those above the median, those above 10 times the median, because we don't have the complete distributions of wealth. And there is a practical reason for this. There is a switch from taxation of wealth to taxation of income. So there is less information available in the archives about the wealth distribution. But it is also because those who worked on uh, on, on wealth and who did of, course, who did, of course, a marvelous job, people like Piketty and uh, other people who work with him, like Postel Vinet or Jean-Laurent Rosenthal, um, they focused on the top wealth shares, right? They didn't reconstruct a complete distribution. So this kind of you know, limitates a bit what we can do with the, with the data. But the idea, uh, I think, is, 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 is relevant. It would be nice to be able to also measure the prevalence of the rich, again, in relative terms, for modern societies. But right now, it's pretty complicated because we don't have the right information for that. I want to ask you more about the sources um, used to to get this data. But before that, I would like to keep with the theme of um, how the rich have evolved over time. And I'm curious about who these rich people were in the sense of, and you use a very nice term, I really like that, the path to affluence, if I'm not wrong. What were those paths to affluence? How did people uh, become rich? And what type of activities they performed? What type of assets did they have? How did they preserve their wealth over time? What what are your findings in that sense? Right. So I begin by distinguishing, distinguishing what are, I think, the main paths to affluence across history or in the case of one of these, which is finance, one which we should really disentangle because it's also relevant for certain current concerns. So I distinguish between the path of nobility, the path of entrepreneurship and innovation, and then I single out the path of, uh, of finance. Now, the point of is, is that across the ages, <laughs> it's relatively richer, sorry, it's relatively easier to become rich in one way or in another. We begin with the Middle Ages when uh, the path of nobility was, of course, very important. And if we go far back in time enough, we find nobility beginning. So we find people who actually become noble, usually because they have some sort of martial virtue or because, of, because they do some sort of service to the sovereign. But then this becomes increasingly an inherited position, right? So this is also important because talking about the nobility um, brings directly to the to the fore the question of inheriting wealth versus building one's own wealth. Then if we look at how you could use, uh, how if you weren't a noble, you could use your uh, skills and um, entrepreneurship to become rich, then uh, in pre-industrial times, um, the, the I mean, a very important uh, area is that of uh, uh, long-range trade. 
from the uh, commercial revolution of the Middle Ages, from the 11th century, to the new opportunities opened by the uh, Atlantic trade routes at the turn of the 16th century and, and later, we see that this is really um, a path which creates many new opportunities. And then you get to the 18th and 19th century and you have the Industrial Revolution, the first and second Industrial Revolution. That's another, uh, there is another change, right? Also in terms of the opportunities open to uh, build up a fortune. Then of course, the problem becomes that if you build a fortune by means of your entrepreneurship, you might also end up establishing a dynasty. So the point becomes whether your descendants who are still commoners, unless they try to become nobles themselves, which of course in early modern times and late, late medieval times happens quite, uh, quite a lot. But you know, you have again the problem of uh, made wealth versus inherited wealth. Now, I mentioned long range trade. Uh, long range trade from the Middle Ages required also some specific services, in particular financial services. And then from the Middle Ages already, it's pretty important to look at how uh, finance also allowed to um, build uh, great fortunes. Uh, and this is because some of those fortunes were really large compared to what was possible uh, at that time. Um, and because the, the specific path to wealth has been historically the one which was frowned upon the most. And in a sense, this continues to this day, even if today we are arguably uh, in the period in history, in the last millennia actually, when uh, during which uh, becoming rich by means of activity in finance is more frequent and more important related to other possible paths, uh, paths to affluence. So there is also you know, a lot to, to say about that. And um, this is also the source uh, of some possible concerns actually. Um, I wanna... Um get into i mean when you describe these different paths uh to to affluence and you describe the role of inheritance you open the door to the reflection of how society thought about this rich people right and that has changed over time as well what um what can you say about that? How have we changed our perception of what being rich means? And what are probably the moral implications of that and maybe the implications for policy interventions? Right. So if we begin with the Middle Ages, we begin with a situation in which quite clearly the fact that commoners became very wealthy was seen as a problem. The wealth of the nobility has never been a problem from that point of view because it was supposed to correspond to God's plan and to how uh, society had to be organized. The problem was with commoners who became very wealthy, even wealthier than the main nobles actually. And the problem is that from the point of view of medieval Christian theology, if you became wealthy, you were a sinner by definition, because why were you accumulating that wealth, which you could have used for charity towards the poor, right? And, uh, and the point is, from the point of view of theologians, which who in the Middle Ages were shaping very much the general culture, the, the rich didn't have a place in society because in the perfectly organized Christian society, you didn't want to have those sinners, right? Then what happens, and this begins uh, with the new opportunities of the late Middle Ages, which begins with the commercial revolution, and what happens is that you have in practice that, especially in some parts of Europe, like Italy or the low countries, some individuals start becoming extremely rich. And those who are extremely rich, these commoners who are extremely rich, become more and more abundant. And you can't ignore them anymore. You can't dismiss them as sinners anymore. And that's when we start seeing some sort of cultural change, right? And we see this in the treatises, in the treatises which who, you know, discuss the possible role of the rich. And we see that 
they start defining a specific function that the rich can play in society, which is basically twofold. First, their private resources can be considered as resources of money into which the public, so the community, can tap in times of dire need by means of loans or even by means of exceptional taxation, right? They are there, they're available, and they can be used if needed. And second, there is the issue of magnificence, if you want. The fact that the rich, by building their palaces and villa, but also by founding monasteries and churches, make the community, the city, splendid. And to some degree, this is to the advantage of everybody. And there is something to say for that, because, you know, you, you couldn't walk along the Canal Grande uh, in Venice today and enjoy the city as you can today if these people hadn't built their palaces in the 16th and 17th century. Of course, they were doing that for their own and to show off their wealth to the other nobles who also had their palaces along the Canal Grande in Venice. But still, we can somehow uh, enjoy, you know, we can, we can reap a, a, a personal benefit in terms of enjoyment from that investment made uh, centuries ago. So this is what you find in, uh, uh, in, in, uh, from the 15th century, right? You have the rich that are considered to be useful because they can help in times of crisis. And you also see this idea that to some degree what they establish, including their own palaces, is something which, at least to some extent, is to the benefit of the public. And this is the beginning of a path which is only strengthened in early modern times by, for example, the uh, Protestant Reformation and by, and by Calvinism and by the beginning of, uh, at least in certain parts of Europe, of this uh, idea that uh, uh, material success somehow reflects uh, um, the fact of having also uh, the favor of God, right? So this becomes something which is ever more socially acceptable, if you want. But this is only the continuation of something which begins from at least the, the 15th century. And then you get to the uh, end of the, say, 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, in which, during which, you know, this is even more legitimate, but there is still some resistance uh, against the idea that the rich, for example, um, start becoming too involved in politics, or even, you know, the idea they might decide to use their money to influence the cultural, the culture, but also more in particular the, the, the political debate and the political uh, dynamics in their own countries. So we move from that situation at the beginning of the 20th century to the one which you experience today at the beginning of the 21st century. And we can observe again another change in our perception of the rich because today, the fact that uh, the super rich in particular are directly involved in politics is much more acceptable than it ever was, I would say, um, in, uh, in, uh, in, in Western history. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, uh, we have uh, um, across the West uh, difficulties in uh, trying to uh, tap into the private resources of the rich and the super rich in times of crisis, although there has been often a specific request from significant parts of population for doing exactly that. I know well the situation in my country. I mean, we had, in Italy, we had, of course, the Great Recession. Then we were affected particularly badly by the sovereign debt crisis uh, a few years after. Then we had, uh, then we suffered a lot from COVID-19. We were one of the countries which were hit the hardest. And then Europe as a whole today has to do with uh, war in uh, uh, in Ukraine and whatever this has uh, brought with it. And in none of these crises, it has been possible to actually increase, even on a temporary uh, manner, the taxation of, uh, uh, of the richest. Uh, and this is interesting, um, but this also means that, uh, um, in a sense, the rich are no longer fulfilling their social role, which I think is a problem, because then the problem becomes again, what's their role in society, right? And this is not clear, because the role that they have played till, at the very least, the middle of the 20th century is exactly that, right? First and foremost, help the collectivity in times of crisis, and that help 
could take place in different forms, but very importantly, by means of higher taxation. Right? Let me ask Even you a temporary now, manner. Right? I, I, I want to... I want us to chat uh, a bit more about uh, the sources, right? And you already mentioned that an essential part of this are tax records of wealth, uh, taxes on wealth, right? How does it work? Like where where are these records? What type of taxes are this that, that were um, being used? Who were paying these taxes? What what can you tell us about it? I'm I'm, I'm pretty curious about how how exactly, even if you have technical uh, stories to tell about the challenges of going to the archives, I'll be very happy to hear about those. Right. Well, in much of Europe, um, I mean, and these are uh, in some sense the, the 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 best possible sources, looking at what we actually find across the European continent. But in much of Europe, especially in the south and in the center of the continent, you, we can rely on these property tax records, right? So these are assessment of the value of the um, taxable uh, properties, which always include uh, real estate, mm -hmm. and very often includes also other items of wealth, for example, the capitals invested in trade. Sometimes they include pretty much everything, uh, like... Um, you know, the, the, the animals or the food reserves, uh, debts and credits. So they really come close to uh, an assessment of uh, the net wealth. And uh, the point is, these records were, were used to establish the relative contributive capacity of households in the community compared to the others, right? So the point is, you assess the wealth of a household you do this for all the households in the community. You have a total, of course. But then the point is you use not really the, the, the value, but you use the share of the total owned by each household to distribute whatever fiscal burden you want to distribute, right? Which may be uh, the burden, the, the tax due to the central authorities of the state or even a local uh, fiscal levy to, for example, uh, raise funds for digging a new canal or whatever the community might want to do. So the point is that the, the records had to place correctly one household compared to the others within uh, the communities. Are, are and, these universal uh, records? So everyone was literally <laughs> being asked about this. So you have everyone in your, yes. your data set. Oh, wow. Yes. The only thing is um, if there are I mean, when there are households who have nothing which can be taxed, then depending to the period and place, those households, which are technically the zeros in the distribution, will be added or not, right? But the point is, as even households which had very tiny properties, for example, households which did not own the house where they lived, but maybe own like one third of a vineyard, this happens relatively frequently, in certain parts of Italy, those were recorded. So those who we miss uh, when uh, the zeros are not recorded, what I call the property less, uh, usually are in between three to seven, eight percent of the total, which means that you can then try and uh, tweak the estimate to take that into account. And you can uh, work on that because sometimes you have that they are recorded and you can, you know, try and make some reasonable hypothesis to also add the zeros to a distribution. But in general, these are very good uh, uh, sources because they are very, very, very comprehensive. And uh, usually uh, they uh, are to be found, I mean, they are, they are usually, they are local, they are produced locally by the community. So they are, I mean, in Italy, they're usually to be found in the archives of each, of each specific city, unless they've been collected for whatever reason, and sent to the to the central archives of each Italian region. And other parts of Europe have a situation which is similar, at least from the point of view of where the source is originally being produced, but it might be a little bit different looking at where the sources are preserved right now, and that depends a lot on uh, national laws about uh, uh, archival records from centuries, from centuries past. But in general, these are local sources, and the good thing is 
they don't change much in time. So, you know, you have a community which basically follows the same rules in recording taxable wealth from, say, uh, the late uh, 15th century until the end of the 18th century. And then from the late 18th century and, sorry, beginning of the 19th century, um, these sources disappear. They are no longer produced because there is a change in how um, in how the taxation of land in particular is, uh, is performed. That's the introduction of the so-called modern cadastre system, which is the one we still use today, uh, which involves you know, measuring properly uh, each plot of land, drawing maps and whatever. And that, unfortunately, is the end of my historical records because you, I can't continue uh, doing what I did for the previous period also when the system changes to that. Let me get back to something that you mentioned, <clears throat> which is how the rich face regularly different type of shocks, right? And you have talked about um, the financial crisis, for instance, and and about um, diseases. Um, and but what's your general take on regarding this, right? Uh, we have this big stories allow Walter Schittel that, you know, that inequality is really only visibly declining when you face these massive catastrophes. Is that what you, what you find? What are these moments you already mentioned with some, some of the moments when we seem to see reductions in, in the amount of rich people, right? Um, but how prevalent they are. I mean, you have a point there. So what, what, what's that yeah. point? Okay, no, I am a relatively more optimistic compared to Walter Scheidel. And uh, I am more optimistic because I, 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 I begin with a sort of pessimistic observation, which is that after the Black Death, not even uh, uh, plagues on a comparable scale. I mean, events which... Uh, like the 1630 plague in central North Italy killed 35% uh, of the population, so huge events, but they didn't reduce inequality, right? And then if you look at why they didn't reduce inequality, the point is that um, the societies have become resilient to that kind of shock in terms of protecting patrimonies from the kind of distributional shock, right? And the point is, if we start thinking along those lines, we realize that the long run distributive dynamics are much more the consequence of our actual agency. So of our agency, how is, uh, and, um, and, of, and, and how it uh, shapes uh, in time our institutional framework, if you want, then you might think otherwise, because otherwise you could see, okay, see, you could think, okay, so this is kind of a natural process. It's always going to increase. And, uh, and, uh, and the cure is worse than the illness. Uh, and then, of course, the problem is that historically, you, you don't find the, you, you don't find the, the framework re reducing inequality till the 20th century, right? But then the story of inequality reduction from World War I, for, from World, World War I to World War II and in between uh, the, the, the two wars is also very much the story of changes in institution, including in fiscal systems. And then the tendency for inequality of both income and wealth to decline continues for a couple of decades after the end of World War II. And that's again because of certain policies which are implemented and uh, a specific institutional framework, which includes, for example, um, very progressive taxation, right? Uh, of incomes and to some degree also of inheritances and sometimes also of, uh, uh, of wealth. Uh, and so the point is, it's also a matter of choice, right? It's not only a natural tendency interrupted by catastrophe, but as it is also a matter of, of choice, we then can read uh, in a little bit different way the fact that the catastrophes of the 21st century, which of course so far haven't been uh, on a scale uh, comparable to the Black Death or to the, or to the World Wars, but surely, you know, they were not, they were not uh, uh, minor uh, neither. But we can read a different way why they didn't stop 
this uh, tendency for well to become ever more concentrated, if not in a very, very temporary manner, right? So maybe a very, very temporary stop, but then we'll very quickly recover this in particular after the onset of the Great Recession. Um, and the point is, is then this, okay, so this great resilience, this exceptional resilience of the patrimonies of the rich and in particular super rich today, how has that been achieved? And well, you know, if you really think about that historically, I think you have to come to the conclusion that it also reflects the fact that the rich have been able you know, to prevent being asked again, or I mean, they haven't been asked again in practice to contribute more during the crisis, right? And then the problem becomes why it hasn't been possible to, you know, change the framework again, even just a temporary manner in order to make the most affluent uh, contribute more to, to, to pay the bill of the crisis. And then you can start wondering whether this is because maybe they have this greater political influence compared to the first part of the 20th century. And that's when, you know, you might start thinking that maybe we're a bit in trouble and this is maybe something that we should be aware of and think about whether we are following a path that we would really want to continue to follow in the forthcoming years. Let me ask you more about that, about how the rich are frequently perceived as a community, right? As an elite. And that's frequently there in our conversations about how society operates. And specifically, when we think about inequality, we think about the elites are controlling politics and so on, right? Um, and I'm curious about your your takes on that what are the um the collective action challenges and mechanisms that the reach uh face right and i'm asking you partly because i, I work on elites so I'm, I'm particularly yeah. interested in in the topic but um what do you what do you think about that how what have you learned from looking at these rich people how cohesive they are as a community, how homogeneous are they, how capable of um, uh, getting together and achieving things they actually actually are. What's, uh, what's your view on this uh, type of questions? Right. So, of course, I mean, the rich and the super rich are human beings, and uh, each one of them uh, is an individual and uh, has a uh, hair of his own um, motivations, right? So it's not like I would presume to be able to, to, to say, to tell what they think as a collectivity. What they experience as a collectivity is the fact that of not having been asked to, you know, perform this specific role during the recent crisis. So, you know, whatever they personally think about that, they haven't been taxed more. I mean, uh, we know, I think it was like two days ago, uh, again, the uh, In Tax With Trust campaign was uh, uh, addressing a, a letter to, 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 to those convened in Davos asking to be, you know, to be taxed more. And that's, you know, a group of very, very rich people who collectively is championing exactly that kind of, of policy. So it's not like everybody has the same idea. And yet, collectively, they experience disadvantage, again, the advantage looked only from the point of view of uh, their ability to continue to grow richer and richer without having to contribute more during, again, the crisis or in general, to contribute more to, to society. And uh, something that I think they also experience collectively is this much greater acceptance of their uh, uh, political involvement compared to periods past. Um, and this is again something which uh, is independent, if you want, from uh, the will of the individuals, but as a collectivity, they, they enjoy that. So the problem is the following. 
whatever the individuals think, the moment when the rich and especially super rich are better able to shape policy making happens to be the moment when uh, they uh, also are required less and less to contribute more in times of crisis. And then at least as an hypothesis, we might ask whether one thing is the consequence of the other, right? So even if each individual has error his own view, the prevalent, so the, the, the you know, the, the, the prevailing, sorry, the prevailing position would be, you know, the less we are taxed, the better. And so also the prevailing way in which these people might be influenced politics might be exactly uh, functional to push you that objective. And this might be one reason why in most Western countries, it has been so difficult to, to, uh, to again, make the, the, the rich uh, uh, fulfill uh, again, uh, this uh, uh, social goal, which I would argue is deeply enrooted in Western culture. And again, this shows because there have been many requests to the rich for doing exactly that. The in tax campaign, in tax with trust campaign is one example. The Occupy Wall Street uh, campaign was another. There have been many similar campaigns, uh, also from you know the bottom of society uh, across the years, but they achieved very little. So you know the question is why is that? And if you know if really, and I would you know formulate this as a as an hypothesis, if really as a collectivity, and again, in terms of you know the prevailing position, the, the, the rich are using the greater political influence today to achieve these results, then the fact that their wealth is only continuing to grow, making them ever more different uh, from the rest of society. So, you know, uh, <laughs> ever better able to act as I as I've written in the book, as gods among men, but this is actually, you know, a paraphrase of uh, what uh, uh, medieval theologians were uh, uh, were saying. Um, then we have we, we we might maybe have to worry <laughs> about the future, right? Because where the, where is this leading us? And admittedly, I don't have, of course, in my book. Uh, all the all the answers to these questions. So for me, it was important to at least ask these questions. There are many aspects of these which need to be explored better and possibly even quantified. I I I, I would say, in some sense, I was surprised not to find more in the literature about you know the collective action of today rich, at least not in the scientific literature, and so it think that there is also there as, as a, a very uh, substantial opportunity for additional research. And I would say this again to the young scholars who might be listening to this, there is also, uh, I think, really a, a, a need, for example, to explore the change in the behavior of the rich and the perception of the rich from, say, the 1950s until, until today, because there something happens which uh, uh, I think, uh, based on what we have right now, remains a bit uh, mysterious, or at least it's the subject also to to speculation. So it would be to it would be very interesting to explore it better. Let me take that to ask you two final questions around this uh, theme of the future, right? So on the one hand, I want to ask you about how you see the field evolving in the near future, right? And and here I think that's something that I'm particularly curious is about what you see as the work and the discoveries in other parts of the world, right? And you have uh, worked recently on the Aztec Empire, for instance, right? So how do you see those agendas evolving? What are the challenges that you foresee there? How do you think that the landscape on our understanding of historical inequality broadly understood would uh, would evolve. And the other one is a more practical type of question that you have already sort of anticipated maybe where your answer is going to uh, go about how do you think that 
in the coming years, we're going to deal with uh, the issue of the super rich and again, the broader issue of inequality. Are you optimistic? Do you think that this growing concern, at least from academia and in the public opinion, is going to be translated into policies that move, move things in a different direction? I guess in general, what I'm asking you here is how do you think that things are going to change? And if we meet again in 10 years to chat about this, what things would have uh, changed uh, ever since? Right. So let me begin with the question about the field. Uh, and, and by field, I suppose you mean the, um, the economic history of inequality or maybe more general economic history. So I, I think, and also based on uh, the, the people uh, in, my, in my network, those who uh, I know are working on, the, on this topic, I, I think that uh, um, our efforts in trying to also, you know, to begin with, to measure better these dynamics in the long run uh, will only continue. So we will uh, know more about more and more areas of Europe and the world. And uh, I think, and I'm sure, that uh, a few years from now we will have uh, um, you know much more about uh, inequality dynamics in uh, non-European areas, and this is great because then we will be able to uh, study um, you know this divergence between um, say Western Europe and East Asia from a different perspective, and to you know also add a different setting to our general debates about the long uh, um, about the about the roots of long run uh, uh, distributive uh, uh, changes and i also think that uh, this field is i mean the the fact that this field is flourishing is also very good for economic history more generally because this is one area in which we are constantly reminded of the connection that we must have with our sources, right? Because the debates, and these include the debates about, uh, say, inequality in the US in the last decades, which is something that is currently uh, the object of, uh, of contention. But these debates in the end are about the measures and the data. And this is very important because this is something that we as economic historians have to continue to do, and hopefully this has to be recognized uh, uh, I mean, by, the, by the profession, but also by our departments more generally as a worthy uh, endeavor, right? But again, in this specific area, you know, working on the data, beginning maybe with the historical sources in the archives is, as of now, you know, the only way to produce something new. And the real, you know, debates are always, again, about the numbers and the data and the measures. Um, now, about the future of inequality. Uh, so I am not optimistic about one thing. I don't think that the current tendency, which is still orientated towards inequality growth, I don't think that it will disappear on its own. Uh, so, for example, on this, I kind of disagree with uh, Branko Milanovic. I agree with him on many things, but on this, uh, I, I don't. And I would not want to make a, a, a wishful hypothesis as uh, Kuznet did uh, uh, in 1955. So I think that current tendency will continue also because, unfortunately, I don't see the, the, the beginning of a possible change in policy, right? If I look at uh, the political debates in the in the countries that I know better or which I'm more interested in, I don't see any real sign that this might change in a substantial way. So if truly the only way we can invert the tendency is by having policies which are more redistributive, also, you know, not for the purpose of reducing the wealth of the rich. But for the purpose of leveling the playing field, that's that's you know that's the objective that we should have in mind in a modern democratic country, also, right? Because we have to also think a bit about the substantial equality of access to institutions and whatever. And this also requires some sort of you know leveling of the playing field, looking at education and so forth and so on as well. And that requires resources, right? So the point is, um, I, I don't see 
an inversion of the tendency in the political debates. Uh, what makes me worried, however, is that I don't think that this can continue forever, right? So from a certain point of view, and this is something that I argue for in my book, I don't think that the rich should be happy about the fact that they haven't been required to contribute more in the last years. Because actually, I think they collectively, and again, independently from the will of each specific rich individual, but they have lost a great opportunity to kind of show to society that they are, you know, in the same boat as we all are, in a sense, right? Um, and then uh, it's difficult to, to foretell, but this surely is going to create more debate, more debate and more tension across society uh, in the future, I think. And the outcome of that, I don't know. That might be then the beginning of a change in um, the political discourse, of course, and that might be, uh, might, might, might be good, but we'll see. What seems sure is that certain super rich individuals in certain very rich countries in the world will be very heavily involved in politics in the upcoming months and maybe years. So, Yeah, I guess we will have to talk again then in 10 years to see what uh, has <laughs> happened. But let me thank you a lot. This was uh, very interesting. I enjoy a lot reading the book. This was a lovely conversation. Let me show again the cover of the book. I really like it. I highly recommend the book to all of our listeners. Uh, it covers much more than what we had the chance to talk today. Uh, but it was already uh, fascinating. Thanks a lot, Guido. I hope to see more of your work um, uh, coming soon. Thanks to you. It has really been a pleasure to, to talk with you and to everybody who was listening. Thanks. Thank you for tuning in today to the Economic and Political History Podcast. Don't forget to stay connected with us on YouTube and Spotify. I'm your host, Javier Mejia from Stanford University. Feel free to follow me on Twitter at Javier Mejia C and connect with me on LinkedIn. You can find me as Javier Mejia Cubillos. Until next time, stay engaged. Thank you and take care.